In this video, I'm going to take you through a real-time demo of a painting of this Canadian cowboy. Now, uh, full disclosure, this is going to be, if you like, a work in progress real-time demo. So I'm not going to completely finish this painting in this video, but you will see the painting develop to quite an extent. If you saw the thumbnail, you'll get an idea of how far I take it in this particular installment. So the story behind this painting uh, it's really kind of cool. I've been starting to use LinkedIn a little bit, um, just very gently, but regularly updating my LinkedIn account with, um, you know, work that I'm producing and putting little videos up and things like that of my art. And a Canadian rancher, Curtis McAleer of McAleer Ranching, he got in touch and said, you know, hey, if you want to use some of the videos that we have on our YouTube channel as inspiration for a painting, then please feel free to go ahead. So that was a really cool thing for him to offer to do. Um, and I've, I've obviously taken him up on that offer. That's where I got the screen grab from. So thank you very much, Curtis, for that. Uh, much appreciated. Um, by the way, if my voice sounds a bit funny uh, this week, I do apologize. I've got a bit of a cold. So um, that's that's why my voice might sound a little bit off. Um, anyway, back to the painting. So I'm working on A2 mixed media paper. I've put the line drawing in um, using a watercolor marker, burnt umber. And what I'm doing now is just coming in with a little bit of a filbert brush and using burnt umber interactive acrylic. And I'm just kind of going back to a technique I haven't used in a little while. So I thought it would be good fun to revisit. And what I'm doing is just referring to the reference. I'm just picking out key areas and making those dark if they're broadly speaking, dark and just leaving them untouched if they are either mid-tone or light. Now, you know, there's a few little challenges for me in this painting. Uh, the first of which is that although I'm working at a, on a fairly large piece of paper, my normal size, the, the subject, again, that takes up most of the, uh, you know, most of the composition. But because it's a man on horseback, the actual size of the man and the horse are actually smaller than I would normally paint for the main subject. So consequently, I've got to strike a little bit of a balance between using brushes small enough to be able to get things nice and precise. But at the same time, I want to stay fairly expressive. So that's in part why I'm taking the approach that I'm taking by forcing myself to look at just the darks and the lights does away with any confusion to do with color or the intricacies of, you know, perhaps some of the fixings of the saddle and the reins and things like that. So you can see that I've put a nice deep shadow in underneath the brim of the hat where that hat is casting a shadow over the shoulder and the upper back of the guy. And then the leg is obviously casting a shadow on the horse's uh, flank. And there's obviously a shadow on the underside of the belly. And then there's quite a dark shadow where the, um, I'm not actually sure what you call that kind of pad or mat that the saddle sits on top of, but that's casting a shadow on the horse's body as well. So I can just begin to very steadily introduce these patches of dark. And in doing that, that begins to create a sense of three dimensions on top of the line drawing. Now, one of the things that happens as I'm applying the paint here, so I'm putting the paint down on dry paper and it's more or less neat straight out of the tube, 
is that you get the, and the, the paper's a little bit textured as well. So you can see perhaps on the rear end of the horse there, or on the left-hand edge of the tail, a little bit under the, uh, the, the bottom edge of the head there, we've got these kind of dry brush marks. And they add quite a bit of character to the brush mark that you put down. So there's always this kind of question with any of the art that I create, and I think it's a general question that artists ask themselves is, and that is, you know, when, when do we stop? Um, because sometimes on the, with that first layer of paint, what you put down, you, you get some interesting effects, which you can't really replicate ever again. So for example, I quite like at the moment, the way the tail is looking and I'm not sure, you know, do I need to do any more? Now that may change as I change other parts of the painting, but you know, nevertheless, it's, it's just an interesting question to ask. Okay. So now we're on to the second part of this technique. And that is, I'm going to just apply some very, you know, approximate colors to key areas. But as I do this, so this is basically pure alizarin crimson and possibly with a little bit of tinting white, actually. Um, but I'm applying that fairly thinly onto the shirt, but I'm putting it over the top of that burnt umber as well. So that's going to have a kind of glazing effect. It's going to slightly soften the hard edges of the burnt umber. Uh, and it's a quick way to just sort of dial back the very stark, dark and light that we've established so far. Now, as you may have ascertained just with the first application of color, um, I'm not particularly, you know, as is my style, I'm not looking to replicate this reference photo exactly. And in fact, um, you know, the background will change quite dramatically as well. So I'm not interested in copying, you know, the exact color of the shirt, for example. And then while that paint is still damp, I'm coming in with a little bit more of the tinting white in the mix and just doing a little bit of wet in wet, softening uh, some of the, you know, some of the darks a little bit further, but also just adding some very subtle highlights to the shirt. And I can soften further some of those dark edges as well. So I actually did a, a video uh, about um marketing for artists on linkedin i think it must have been nearly a year ago now and my plan was to do one of those every month well that that didn't happen but as i said i have been gently updating my linkedin uh, profile with very you know fairly regular updates but you know just in a very paced way um so although i haven't done a further video i do plan on doing another one at some point because i feel i have learned a few things along the way and my kind of network is still pretty small. I've only got about 200 followers or so, but the idea is to document the journey so that if I do manage to grow it to a substantial following and it leads somewhere from, you know, just from more sales or more publicity or whatever, then hopefully it'll be helpful to other artists who are thinking of doing the same. Now I used a similar red on the face of the guy, even though you haven't got the shadow quite deep enough there. I added a little bit of cadmium yellow though. Uh, while I was chatting away, when I added the red kind of uh, t uh, red hue to the uh, to the face of the chap. Now for the jeans, it's just pure ultramarine blue. That was the first application. And again, coming in with a little bit of the tinting white, just to add a little bit of subtle highlight. And I'm basically going to be following that similar technique for the first coat of paint. So this is now some of the alizarin, some of the cad yellow, and a lot more of the tinting white for the beginnings of a flesh tone. And for now, I'm using exactly that same color onto the hat. Now watching this back, um, the proportions of the horse seem, you know, quite a long way out. I think that's because of the angle I've got the camera compared to the paper. It's not quite square on. So um, I may have to adjust that later.
and you can see I'm continuing with that, that same color pretty much to just begin to coat the paper on the lighter parts of, of the horse and the saddle and the, the various fittings as well. Now, the brown I'm applying at the moment is actually burnt umber mixed in with some tube orange. So that's my one of my first new discoveries, really, in this painting is what a nice kind of coppery brown the combination of those two colours creates. And again, as I'm watching this back, one of the ideas that's popping into my mind is that, you know, as you mix up different browns, so you can see I'm applying a slightly redder brown now to uh, to the, I think I'm using the right term here, the chaps on the on the legs of the guy there. Um, and it just occurred to me, you know, I could do, I, I think I might have mentioned this a long time ago in a previous video, but never got around to doing it. You know, brown's a colour I tend to use fairly sparingly. I don't really use it as an artistic statement too much. And I'm now sort of thinking, well, you know, maybe I should do a, an entire painting of browns com com comprised completely of just browns with just a patch of orange or a patch of blue somewhere. That might be quite cool to do, actually. Um, now, in my typical way, if you see me paint cattle and things, I often end up quite often painting blue cattle or sheep with bits of blue in their fleece. So although this horse isn't blue, there are, if you look very carefully, some ever so slight hints of blue in the highlights. They are, you know, pretty subtle, but they are there. So doing my usual thing and exaggerating those, just getting in some pale ultramarine mixed with the tinting white and just having some fun experimenting with the colours I'm putting down. One of the things I'm, I'm getting from, um, from this painting so far is I want to work on a slightly larger scale. Um, you know, I'm going to keep the overall painting on the same size piece of paper, but um, I just kind of feel I need to go just a little touch bigger just to make my life that little bit easier.
Now you can see I've added green to the saddle there. Quite a dramatic difference from the colour in the reference. And there are also hints of green in the horse as well, in the horse's body. Um, but again, I'm just playing here, really. I'm just sort of experimenting a little bit with what I think I'm going to be able to get away with to kind of start to establish my style in terms of creating this new subject. And the other reason I've chosen the green is obviously green's complementary to red. So that's going to try that's going to tend to bring up the reds in the in the browns that are nearby and also the red of the shirt. Okay, so now you can see, now that I'm filming at a, uh, a better angle, you can see the proportions of the horse's body are looking a bit better now. It's still, you know, perhaps not still, still not perfect, but, um, uh, you know, certainly better than it appeared from the, the previous camera angle. And you can also see that I put a background in, so that's just simply a mix of cerulean blue and um, uh, tinting white. No, uh, titanium white for the background. So the titanium white is the opaque white, gives a nice matte finish. The tinting white, as the name implies, is more translucent and is better for overlaying with glazes and things and have, getting more sort of subtle variations in tone. So I'm just adding a few highlights now. This is just cad yellow and still with the tinting white now that I'm back on the main subject. Still, I, I pretty much stuck, I think, with the this filbert brush for the entire painting so far, um, which is very, very unusual for me. Um, but it's cut, well, I suppose I was going to say it's one of the consequences of dealing with a relatively complex subject because of, obviously you've got the horse and the rider. Um, the guy, although it's not a portrait, you've got to capture the hat, the face, the hands the shirt, the trousers, the shoes, all of these things being different colours. <clears throat> Excuse me. All of these things being different colours. And then you've got um, the horse and, and, all, and the saddle and the harness and the reins. And then the, the guy's obviously got a rope, which I'm going to have to deal with in a bit. Um, and so on and so on and so on. So there's lots of different things, lots of different things going on. And at the moment, I'm taking quite a, by my standards or by, you know, for my particular style, a relatively representational approach in that I'm depicting all of those things. And what I'm thinking now is, you know, I'll either keep, I, I may work this up into a finished painting and do two versions of the subject. It, we'll see how it goes. Um, or I may leave this one as more of a preliminary study and then do a more, a more stylized, simplified version for the, for the other version of the painting and you know kind of see which one i prefer really where you know where i might sort of oft, often the most impactful paintings in my experiences are where we you know depict the you know the minimum but still convey the message now i'm just adding sunglasses here because you perhaps can't see in the reference at the scale it is on screen but the the uh the guy's wearing sunglasses and i thought that was a really nice touch because the you know Again, I'm not not a rancher. I'm certainly not an expert in Canadian ranching. So at a glance, what I'd painted so far, I 
you know, it's relatively timeless, you know. But the fact they're wearing the, the chaps wearing sunglasses, that makes it more modern day to my eyes. So I quite like that to include those. Now the face at the moment is looking far too red, so I'm going to need to address that. But adding shadows to the the, the flesh tones of the hands. Um, there I've mixed up the alizarin crimson, some ultramarine blue and cad yellow. Now it's very tempting when you're depicting hands to get into the intricacies of the fingers and thumbs early on. But in a painting, certainly when working at this scale, I feel it's much better to think of the situation. I, I've never really sculpted. I think I've maybe tried it once or twice in my life. But if you think of it instead as, you know, just a block of stone that you've got to kind of shape into something hand shaped. And then after you've done that, then you would carve out the little recesses between the fingers and things like that. If you take, if you get yourself into that mindset, it's easier to deal with those complexities because you basically end up ignoring the complexities early on. So another thing I'm thinking of for the future painting is what I've been doing so far is, to, is taking more of an illustrative approach where I'm, I've been more or less colouring in my drawing. So now I'm thinking more, well, if I was going to paint this again, what I might do is put in a swathe of blue for the entire leg area. And then for the brown of the chaps, I would then paint over that blue for the chaps. And then for the sleeve, I'd paint over that with red. And then for the hand, I'd come in with the flesh tone. So that's a different approach. Less fiddly would allow for use of a bigger brush. And I think if I do a fairly well considered drawing in the first place, then I think I should be able to do that in such a way as to be expressive, but still maintain accuracy. Now I'm going very dark with some of these shadows here. So this is burnt amber mixed with ultramarine blue.
So now you can see that um, my need to return to larger brushes uh, has uh, revealed itself. So I thought I would, uh, I quite like the sketchiness of the horse as it is actually, but And apply the paint nice and smoothly you can see this is you know a much bigger brush so i thought i'd just come in and solidify the horse with the application of more paint And you can see on the rear end of the horse there, some of the, some of the dark color, color that I showed earlier um, was showing through. So um, that kind of worked quite well. So spraying the, this interactive acrylic with water was easy blending. And so you can see I'm now adding on top of that first coat of paint uh, a more reddish brown. It looks almost red, doesn't it, in the, on the camera, but I'm pretty sure I'd, I'd mixed it up with something else to make a brown. So what I'm really doing here is experimenting with the type of wet in wet effects I can get with this flat brush to, you know, just 
capture some of that sort of smooth um, surface quality you get, you know, on a on a horse. Um, but at the same time, depict that the variation in colours that you get as well. You can see by taking the approach of, you know, forcing oneself to make bigger marks, it kind of forces you to simplify. So in many ways, it's often a better approach. But as I said earlier, it is a trade-off between that and, and the precision of mark you can make. 